Energy Intelligence would like to welcome the International Gas Union, SNAM, and Rystad Energy uh, for the launch of their 2023 edition of the uh, Global Gas Report uh, here at the Energy Intelligence Forum. Uh, this is their uh, fifth annual uh, release, so it's, uh, it's quite an honor to be able to host them. Uh, I would like to introduce on stage uh, Tatiana Kamberg, uh, the I International Gas Union Strategic Communications Director. Uh, Cloud, uh, sorry, Simon uh, Shodhun, a uh, partner at Rystad Energy, and Claudio Farina, uh, Chief Strategy and Technology Office, Officer for SNAM. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Jaime, for, for a great introduction. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be back here again this year. And it's been a really interesting conference, for sure. Uh, lots of really great discussions and uh, thought-provoking sessions. So uh, very happy to be here. It's, it's, it's also an honor for us. So yes, it's, it's the fifth report that we've done together with SNAM. The first report was actually released uh, as a special uh, production for the World Gas Conference in Washington. That was in 2018. And so I thought it'd be fun to look back in that, uh, at that first report, uh, just short years, uh, six, six short years ago, what we're, were we saying about the world of gas and what did it look like? And interestingly enough, we're also six years away from 2030, so it provides for a bit of a, a bit of an interesting contrast, I think. So, just a, a 30 second summary of the key takeaways. In 2018, we were seeing a 4% growth uh, in in gas demand globally, which was about double the previous average from uh, from 2010. This was a time of uh, ample supply coming from the from the U.S. shale. Uh, we had a globalizing market. We had lots of supply, and, and things were looking very positive. So, uh, the IEA was projecting a 1.6 percent growth for the next uh, several decades. They were projecting that gas was going to become the second most important primary uh, energy source by 2040, and the only fuel next to renewables that would be growing consistently over the coming decades. So things seems to have, seem to have changed a little bit uh, now that we're standing here in 2023. 20, 20, uh, and uh, we were looking at the, at the world at that time and saying that demand will likely grow in, uh, in, in the areas where primary energy is still expanding, primarily in the non-OECD Asia, in Africa, uh, and uh, in areas where there still needs to be industrialization and development. I think those fundamentals still remain the case, uh, but uh, certainly at the point at, at that time we couldn't have imagined that the kind of turbulence and the kind of shocks uh, that we have been seeing over the last couple of years. I think that may have been the problem, uh, because in fact, being in the well-supplied market in in very comfortable price environment with ample uh, flexibility, the world has forgotten. Uh, about energy security uh, priority in, in a way that requires sort of planning ahead a little bit and thinking about where the demand is going to go and what supply will need to be happening, uh, investments need to be happening. So, so I, I think we've been reminded uh, quite, uh, quite strongly about the energy security priority in the last, uh, in the last couple of years. And now it's a time to, to sort of step back and, and, uh, and think about that. And I think this report is, we think that this report is very critical in the sense that it does call for stepping back. It does call for looking at the trajectory that we're heading in uh, it's towards 2030 and beyond uh, to think about where supply is, is, is heading, where demand might be heading, heading more realistically. And to get away from this divided world mentality, uh, ideally, and to start to think about uh, a more collaborative approach towards, uh, towards a really a common problem, which is reducing emissions throughout the entire economy. And that means not just electricity, that means the entire energy system, electricity today is still worldwide about 20% of that. And to get to, to the Paris goals, we really need to be thinking about the entire energy system. And for that, you need to think about uh, other fuels beside electricity. And uh, of course, electrification is very important. It's going to happen, but it's not, gonna, it's not going to be happening universally and at the same rate and at the same level across the world. So it's really important, I think, for, for all of us to start to collaborate across the industry as we try to do with the, with the International Gas Union, but also across the energy sector and across uh, policy, et cetera, to, to really get to the, most, the fastest, most economic, most efficient way to reduce emissions, which really is the goal. Thanks, I'll uh, stop with that. So, 
Claudio. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. So uh, 2023 Global Gas Report gives us uh, uh, some very insightful views on uh, an year where uh, the global gas system had to cope with unprecedented challenges uh, as all the sides of the equation deeply transformed, deeply changed in this year. Uh, at least in Europe, uh, we deeply changed uh, the supply, so the gas routes that were supplying uh, gas to Italy prices increased volatility, and demand also transformed. I think that we can uh, get uh, at least three key insights from the report this year. The first one is about how much natural gas is central, how much it is key, both to the molecular side of the energy system and to the electron side of the, elect uh, of the, of the system by providing a source of flexibility to, uh, to the electricity. Uh, let's think about what happened to prices. In Europe, prices on average were at 100 euro per megawatt hours with respect to a long, a long time average before, which was in the range of 15 to 20. So prices were uh, five times, seven times higher on average and peaked at 250, 300 euro per megawatt hour. So they peaked at basically 20 times the long time average. And also in this price setting, the global gas demand just decreased by few single digit percentage point. Uh, second point is about gas infrastructures. Uh, they proved to be very resilient and very flexible, um, particularly thanks to LNG and storage. Uh, Europe as a, as a region was able to cope uh, with a, a sudden and unpredicted change in uh, supply gas routes in a very short time frame. Third point is about uh, what we can see as an equilibrium, as a new equilibrium in the energy trilemma, uh, security, affordability, and sustainability of supply. Um, let's say that for a while, uh, we all looked at the trilemma for a sort of, in a sort of polar polarized view. So for years, we focused mainly on the sustainability issues. Then all of a sudden, when prices started to rise, we focused a lot on affordability of energy. Then security became top of mind, and we basically forgot all the rest. And then again, we step back to, to price and to affordability. I think that for the future, the big lesson learned is that we must look at the energy trilemma as a whole, and that all the three sides of the trilemma are pretty much linked. As, for example, we all realized uh, that sustainable gases, so the carbonized gases, uh, help also a lot in terms of security of supply and uh, reduction of dependency uh, of Europe from other countries. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, I think that we, we can draw the, the conclusion that we need to reinforce and to accelerate the investment in infrastructures. Uh, in future proof and flexible infrastructure, both to secure supply and to, to secure affordability, and to get prepared to integrate in our energy system also low carbon gases. Thank you. Thank you, good morning everyone. So pleasure to be here, pleasure to uh, present some uh, highlights from the, from the report. Uh, we will have a bit of a look in the, in the rear mirror to see so what has happened on the supply and the demand side. I will also look a bit forward to see how uncertainty looks like in both on the supply side and on the demand side, and we'll end with some key, uh, key conclusions on, on how we see uh, the outlook. So let me just start with 2022 and look at the prices, right? I think. Uh, the volatility we saw in 2022 is just staggering, right? Uh, in one way, the, the numbers you see on the, on the y-axis is something that would have been crazy, right? To put it literally, if you put that on a 2018, 2019 type of chart. So it's been absolutely staggering volatility at very high prices as a consequence of the supply disruptions that we observed in, in 2022. So you see that uh, both in Europe, uh, but also in Asia, and the markets where uh, spotted cargoes of LNG is certainly sort of the key 
marginal suppliers. That volatility obviously transcends into demand changes as, as well. You can see on the left-hand side the overall demand of global consumption of gas has stayed relatively flat over the last year, what Claudio also mentioned. But if you look at regional differences, there is way more nuance to this picture than what the global number would otherwise show you. So you can see on the, very, on the right hand chart, you can see it's America that sort of has been growing most. While on the right hand side of that left hand, um, uh, left -hand side of that chart, you can see it's Europe and Asia has taken the, the brunt of the declines in demand, right? Europe as a function of obviously the high prices and also uh, weather impacts and so on has helped to you know, curtail demand and in many ways also been very helpful for getting through the supply disruptions last year. And also Asia done as a consequence of Europe um, uh, buying a lot of the cargoes that otherwise probably would have flown or uh, gone to, to Asia. And then on the production or the supply side, it's a similar picture there as well, right? It's the American production that has seen the biggest upticks, also a bit of increase in the Middle East um, and other places. On the other hand, it's, it's Russia that has sort of seen the biggest uh, reduction in supply, right? A lot of the Russian production is essentially stranded at the moment and can't find an outlet to customers. So Russian production is certainly one that's, that's helped or has sort of been the main contributor to global supply also staying relatively flat from, uh, from 2021 to 2022. Moving over to low carbon gases and hydrogen in particular, we here look at uh, all the various plants and operational production capacity of uh, hydrogen. We see on the left hand chart what is currently operational and what is under development or what's past the final investment decision, uh, decision gate. However, if you look on the right hand side, we just see how small that is, you know, how tiny that sort of current production capacity is compared to the ambitions and plans and the, the, uh, the, the big capacity production or uh, potential you may have towards the end of the decade. Key point here, a key word there is may because it all depends on you know, what's been discussed on this, in this forum previously, the, you know, this chicken and egg problem of uptakers and producers finding an agreement to unlock all of these plants and get this production actually materializing. And finally, we also can look a bit into the future on, uh, on, on, on um, natural gas. And I think this is a good way to illustrate the uncertainty I think that we're facing now. It's not only uncertainty on the on the demand side that I think we've kind of been looking at for many years, but also uncertainty on the supply side that is quite new now, perhaps compared to what it's been previously. So we can see on the chart here, the lines, that's different uh, demand outlooks from different, different institutions, different scenarios. Um, and we see the, the area chart that is illustrating various uh, life cycles of gas production globally. So the brown is everything that is producing it. Yellow is current on the development resources. Green is different projects that are not yet sanctioned for development and, and could be sanctioned in the future for, for development. So if you look at some of the top uh, demand outlooks, you can see that uh, you basically need everything that's in the pipeline uh, for development over the next years. And you can see that you know, as you approach 2030s, 2040s, you start to develop a big gap. So the world, you know, if you want to meet that type of demand outlook, you need to have more resources put into the supply stack, put into the contingents or project pipeline. Um, there's more than enough resources in the world. We don't think that's an issue, but think about it this way. There's a lot of resources stranded from an export opportunity. However, if you look at uh, the very bottom, uh, sort of the 1.5 and net zero and 1.6 degrees, um, then you obviously don't need that much more uh, developments. So that is the uncertainty sphere that the industry is currently facing and you know that you have to, to think about and deal with. So I think if we try to summarize these points, so you know number one, 22 and 23, uh, it was a big shock to the market. 
um, we saw extreme volatility, high prices, gas to cold switching across the world, uh, increasing coal to all-time high consumption levels. Uh, we saw uh, 2023 currently toning down the volatility, but that is on the back of demand declining and helping to balance the market as well, uh, like we've seen here in Europe. Going forward, uh, scenarios point to a future of high uncertainty. It's what we talked about on the previous slides, a wide range of demand outlooks that you can look at. There's also you know, effectively a wide range on supply outlooks as well that you can look at. So those two factors combined makes the outlook uncertain. And finally, we have natural gas and the low carbon gases as a critical component to the energy system. Um, LNG is uh, a proven excellent manner to transport large vast and quantities of energy. Uh, the previous slide that look, we looked at was only global supply, global demand. There are regional nuances. There will be more need for LNG, LNG to bridge the demand centers and the supply centers in the future. But we also need low carbon gases and behavioral changes to accept or to produce these low carbon gases. And then we're thinking about sort of heat pumps in houses to electrify heating. Uh, we probably need more public acceptance for wind turbines and, uh, and grids to support the production of renewable hydrogen. And we need all these things to add up and come together. Um, so I think the, the key words and the key summary to, to leave, all you, leave you all with is that um, there's an extreme amount of volatility in 2022. Gas markets are currently fragile. It's a fragile market equilibrium. And we don't need too much disturbance in either supply and demand to see volatility rising again. And that's what we, what we think will happen or be the case all the way towards 2030. So important to think about energy planning, important to think about spare capacity and those types of measures to avoid future supply shocks, or future shocks in the market, I mean. Thank you. Uh, Simon and Tatiana. Uh, uh, I would like to open the floor for some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, yes, gentleman over there. Uh, Morten Soxik from American Nord again. Can you say something about the competition between coal and gas in electricity production? On paper, the low hanging fruit is to uh, switch power plants from coal to gas. How easy is that uh, in reality? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, it, that, that is a function of the prices of those commodities. It's a function of the, the carbon taxes of the particular jurisdiction you're in. But it's, uh, I think, you know, the volatility that's been present in the gas market over the last year has not been helpful for particularly Asian economies to look away from coal and try to pursue gas as a lower carbon fuel for the energy systems. Like Asia is what, uh, you know, 50% of the world's population or something like that, right? It's, it's, and they don't have much domestic gas, relatively speaking. Coal is a lot of, is what the domestic resource is there. So from an energy security point of view, I think it's, uh, it's very natural for those countries to look at coal as the key, um, as the key uh, sort of, uh, you know, resource that sort of fulfills that trilemma. And it's unfortunate that gas has seen this volatility of last year to rock that, let's call it the competitive nature versus coal. Um, so I, I hope and think uh, that uh, the industry can, you know, respond to this challenge and, and make gas a, a uh, you know, stable and viable alternative to coal also for these countries. Uh, can I add on this? So I think we should look also at integration of electricity and gas and not only competition in the sense that the more we will add uh, electric renewables, the more the system will become rigid and the more the gas will have a role in giving flexibility to the production of, of electricity and coping with, uh, with the integration of electricity renewables in the grids. Mm. Uh, I'd like to add to it a, a little bit as well because I think it's a very important point. Uh, and last year we've seen significant new additions of new coal 
uh, being, being uh, permitted in both China and India. These are the biggest, China is the biggest energy consumer in the world. Uh, and it, again, putting things in perspective in China, even though it's the biggest energy consumer in the world and I think uh, third biggest gas consumer in the world, gas is still only about 8% of, of China's energy use, while coal is at 56%. So there's, there's definitely a whole lot to be gained by switching from, from coal to gas uh, on emissions and air quality, which has been a very important driver of gas use around the world, and in China particularly. Uh, and, uh, and, and the energy security has been a major driver, I think, in, in, in the other. So we're, we're sort of tracking back more towards coal because both India and China, of course, have domestic coal production. And when gas is in such short supply, and the, 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 the crazy volatility that we've been seeing, uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of the sort of security measures, planning for the future and, and ensuring that there's reliable, uh, reliable supply in some, some of these cases. So certainly, I think the economics, the economics have been there, and even in the previous reports that we've, we've done, those coal to gas switching bands were looking much better when the price of gas was lower. So we need more supply of gas in, in, in the global market to balance the market for that economics to, to, to become favorable again, more favorable again. Uh, to, to build up, uh, just one second, just to build up on that, uh, because you, you know, um, Claudio, I think you said it in your presentation, and uh, I think the three of you have mentioned this as well, which is we need more investment, we need more, more of everything. However, there's a lot of talk about uh, or I think it's in a special fear in, in Europe about uh, building stranded assets. Uh, do you, maybe Claudio, uh, I know that SNAM is an infrastructure company first and foremost. Um, I mean, how, how do you address this fear or is it, is it not <coughs> really a, a big concern? Well, that's a very complex and interesting question. Thank you. Uh, so l let me highlight a little bit what I see in the context before uh, answering to your question. So uh, we are, uh, let's say, in the middle of the energy transition. In reality, I think we are much earlier than in the middle, but we are in the, in the pathway of the energy transition. I think we have more or less clear and we have a more or less common view on where should the target is, but uh, very less clear and very less predictable view on how the path should be to get there. We will for sure have uh, further geopolitical issues in the next decades. Uh, we, will have, uh, we will have technologies ramping up and ramping up at, at um, speeds that we cannot uh, really predict uh, so far. Um, so let's say um, we do not have technological silver bullets, so we can le we have to leverage a mix of technologies, and that's where the importance of investments kicks in. As I mentioned at the end of my presentation before, we need to ensure that as much as possible those investments are flexible, modular, gradual, and most of all, uh, future-proof. What I mean by being future-proof and modular and flexible, for example, floating uh, regasification units are much more flexible uh, and much more modular than uh, onshore regasification units. And for example, uh, uh, gas pipelines may be built and may be repurposed in, or in order to be ready to integrate uh, uh, low carbon hydrogen into the grids. Uh, then let me just add uh, another point. I think we all have clear in mind now that the cost of not doing, the cost of not investing in infrastructure can be measured in the order of magnitude of 100 billions of euro or dollars per year, while the cost of doing infrastructure is in the range of uh, dozens of billion on a 20, 50 years time frame. So there is such a huge difference in the cost of not doing versus the cost of doing that I think we must accelerate and we must go on, even though we may think that there may be uh, a sort of risk of stranded assets. And I guess that also addresses what, uh, what Simon, though, you mentioned the fragile, unstable equilibrium, right? Like more investment is, is yeah. a way to address that. 
Uh, the gentleman over here had another question. Uh, yeah, uh, on the question on China. Uh, what I'm thinking is that China will end up with all the stranded Russian gas and they can set the price themselves. So uh, you're likely to see some big changes in China. Um, does anybody else have any additional comments or questions? Excuse me, I'm Noah Brenner with Energy Intelligence. I was just wondering about um, contracting. I mean, we were talking about uh, infrastructure and you mentioned FSRUs are much uh, easier, they're more flexible. Um, but I think it was Gosiyan Imas uh, yesterday was highlighting, you know, look, people are asking for uh, new LNG liquefaction terminals to be built, but they're saying we're only willing to commit to maybe three years contract, five years contract, 10 years at the most. Um, so what's the impact of kind of the prevailing contracting attitudes on the volatility of gas markets? And is some of this a reliance, a too heavy a reliance on, on spot <coughs> markets rather than long-term contracts? Can, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I would like to comment quickly on, and that kind of touches on the previous question as well. It seems uh, we, we've had this discussion before, and one of uh, our members has made a very, very, uh, I think, uh, sharp observation that it seems that Europe has taken a position that it's better to have not enough than too much. Uh, and that kind of uh, translates into the contracting uh, mentality and, and so everything is just in time and we're trying to avoid that, that risk of, of having too much. Which, which is a position to take and it's a tough position to be in for Europe with the prices where they are in terms of uh, long-term contracts, of course, but that certainly does create additional risk and, and Europe has been exposed uh, significantly to the spot market that's been in the spot market for LNG for, for more than half of its imports. So it's, it's a decision that needs, to be, that needs to be taken with that trade-off in mind. Uh, and uh, again, in the report, we do say that the current level of, of offtake is, is probably not enough to generate sufficient investments into, in, into the LNG production and the new volumes that would be needed to, to really come to a more stable, uh, less fragile equilibrium than we're in right now. Uh, I mean, Claudio, do, do you want to add anything to that? Because I guess, again, SNAM's uh, position is, is uh, contracting should be quite important for that. Yeah, I think, uh, as I said before, uh, the more we are able to inject flexibility in the system, modularity and flexibility, the more uh, we, uh, let's say, cope uh, efficiently and effectively with the, with the trilemma on all the three sides. So we have more affordability, we have more security, and we also have more sustainability because we are more flexible and more uh, ready to adapt uh, to, to the context changing. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, I have, I have an additional question um, uh, just before we, we um, wrap up for today. Uh, maybe for, for Simon, uh, how do you see the, the market outlook for 2024 and 2025 uh, uh, globally, uh, or if you want to specifically talk about Europe? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's sort of, I mean, Europe is the, the, you know, the eye of the hurricane in many ways, so I think 24, 25 uh, depends a lot on the Ukraine transit situation, whether or not you, those BCMs will stop flowing. Um, and then you have everything else around the weather and all of these. I, it goes back to the, to, to the fragility, right? There's so many variables that impacts those two years, and for that matter, the years after as well. It's everything from uh, LNG outages to new projects not coming on stream when expected. That goes both with domestic production and, and LNG production globally. Um, it's the weather that we talked about. It's also Asian appetite for LNG. Um, it's the Russian situation we talked about. So there's just so many variables that plays into it. And you, you don't need many of those to go in the wrong direction before you have a very fragile situation again, right? So you know, to say something about 24, 25 is... Uh, <laughs> It, it's tricky, but you know, some of the simulations we've been doing is it, it rather points to 26, 27 as the challenging years because the domestic production is declining, European that is, 
Um, so then you get more and more vulnerable to having new production coming on production coming on stream. You're also more vulnerable to all the big new energy projects coming on like, in, in, sort of online in the proper time, right? So, and there's also an attritional game of losing that Russian gas over time makes it more and more difficult to, to replace uh, and to build storages up to the levels that uh, we have currently. So, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated question. Uh, it's a complicated answer. To a complicated so question. still fragile on Fra Yeah, I think that's an excellent way of summarizing okay. it. It's fragile. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, please join me to thank the uh, panelists uh, and enjoy the rest of your breakfast.